Hello, my name is John Ortega, and thanks for attending my presentation. Today, I will be presenting a subject that is dear to my heart, the use of big data for machine translation. My goal is to give everyone an idea of how the current state-of-the-art machine translation systems take advantage of big data to include it in artificially intelligent translation systems. Before I actually begin the presentation, I think it would be helpful that everyone understand who I am and what I do. My passion is languages. I love working with languages, specifically as they are found in natural text. Currently, I work for an insurance company called Blackboard Insurance, who is part of a bigger group called AIG. I also perform research and help with courses at New York University in New York, New York. Lastly, I am defending a PhD at the University of Alicante in Alicante, Spain. My two main focuses are on machine translation and text analytics, and I've been working on both for more than 10 years now. Additionally, I've worked the past 20 years as a software developer, manager, and architect. That's enough about me. Let's focus on someone else now, Warren Weaver. Warren Weaver was a student of the great information theorist, Claude Shannon. Claude created a memorandum on translation back in the 1940s for the mathematical world in hopes that people would begin to work on the translation problem. Several countries around the world got involved. There was, and still is, a clear need to be able to translate documents from one language to another because it is nearly impossible to understand others without it. So before we move into the presentation, I'm going to highlight what I will be covering today. First, I'm going to talk about the evolution of machine translation and how we've come along the way in the past 60 or so years. Second, I will give a brief overview of what machine translation actually is and how it works from a practical perspective. Then, I will dive deeper into two main translation or MT paradigms, statistical and neural machine translation. Once we've learned about what the baseline machine translation systems are using, we will see what the state of the art is and how big data and artificial intelligence are used with it. Lastly, we will conclude with some of the later systems, including my academic work, which are focused on specific niche techniques in the field. As stated before, Warren Weaver can be said to have proposed, amongst others, the machine translation challenge to the mathematical community. This involved others around the world specifically in the Soviet Union and the United States, where the first systems were created using simple dictionary-based terms. <clears throat> Later, after some of the major companies like IBM and Systran began to work on the problem, we saw the rise of rule-based machine translation systems. Rule-based MT took the previous dictionary-like entries and added hand-tailored rules at huge scales to provide understandable machine translated text, especially from example-based translation, which combined the ideas from rule-based MT with newer ideas by replacing phrase, phrases based on previous translation. This push was a major advancement, much like what we've seen in the past five years or so with neural networks. After time, more on this entry, quality has taken the front seat. Now, the scientific community uses most of its time pushing the bar on what we've learned until now by using either statistical machine translation or a neural machine translation with big data and machine learning in several manners. In order to better understand what machine <coughs> where machine translation fits into the whole artificial uh, intelligence scheme, I present this graph. Artificial intelligence 
can be said to cover many fields, and it does. Data science could probably be considered the application of a lot of the fields within AI. But let's specifically look at natural language processing, which is a major field of AI gaining more traction recently. In natural language processing, there are several subfields, such as information extraction, question answering, and text generation. While I myself currently work using machine learning and several natural language processing techniques, one of my favorite fields is machine translation. So today, I will cover machine translation in particular because it's a fun topic and it fits well in this conference. Is that OK? Someone actually answered this time. Thanks. Machine translation at a high level can be considered a black box. After all, when most of us want something translated quick, we don't care what the empty system does. We eagerly go to our favorite website like Google or Bing Translate and put our input source sentence in one language and eagerly wait the target sentence translation. For example, by typing in the words, the dog barks at night in Google Translate, the translation I receive within seconds is el perro ladra por la noche. The translation engine didn't tell me any of the cool secrets of how it came up with the translation. That's what makes it a black box. While generally we don't care so much what the system does, today we're going to cover the inner workings of machine translation systems. Machine translation has evolved quickly. There are a lot of different approaches for the four major paradigms, which are example-based, rule-based, statistical, and neural machine translation. The talk today is scheduled for 45 minutes. Therefore, I can only cover the major paradigms at a high level. So we are going to focus on the paradigms from MT that have gained more attention in the past 10 years or so, rule-based, statistical, and neural. The list is in the chart, by no means all-inclusive, but it is surely enough for us to better understand what's the latest and greatest at this point in time. We are going to cover the transfer-based rule system, the phrase-based statistical system, and the RNN-based neural system. A lot of investigation, especially in the past 10 years, has gone into figuring out how to make these paradigms work the best. We will touch on some of these today in my presentation, and feel free to ask any questions after the presentation if you don't understand any of the MT stuff. Before we dive too deep into the three main paradigms, I would like for everyone to understand the impact of them. In the translation sector, while most of us know that neural machine translation is more effective, it still has not taken the forefront in the amount of deployed systems in production. If we base machine translation on revenue alone, 2019 PS market share says that rule-based machine translation is the highest earning system, and thus the one that's in production the most. My talks with other researchers around the world on this subject are mixed. Most of the bigger companies like Systran, Microsoft, and Google are using neural machine translation in some way. Yes, it seems to be true, in my opinion, that many of the production level machines use translation systems that are still rule-based machine translation systems. And the most common case for deployed systems in production is probably some type of hybrid that includes several paradigms to achieve the best quality. I wrote an article on the subject that was uh, re reviewed by peers that speaks to the idea of mixing paradigms with a system called Select T. Feel free to read more if you're interested or ask more questions after the presentation about Select T in general. Now that we've seen how each paradigm does in the professional sector, let's cover some of the more interesting use cases like punctuation, sentences, human quality, 
and the time betraying. The chart here is a depiction of my opinion and may not necessarily reflect everyone else's opinion. You will notice that the neural system has lighter X marks for punctuation and long sentences. That's because while it does better than other systems, like example-based MT systems, it is known to be problematic in those areas. The statistical system covers all of the use cases, but it is known to achieve the highest possible quality like neural systems do. In my research at Alicante and at New York University, we have found that neural machine translation provides the highest quality on specific domains with big data. On the contrary, statistical machine translation seems to require more training and more complex features. Rather than bore you with more high-level details, let's just jump right into the inner workings of MT systems. While example-based machine translation is exciting, we are going to skip it today as we may not have enough time. I'm going to cover the three main paradigms that I constantly use in my work. Rule-based MT, or RBMT, statistical MT, or just SMT, and neural-based MT, or NMT. The introduction to RBMT will be short, as I would like to focus more on SMT and NMT today. But I do not want to leave out RBMT completely, as it serves as a good starting point for understanding how MT works in general. At a high level, this is what happens in an RBMT system. First, the rule, the rule writer, not always the user, adds a source and then a target rule and verifies it. Then, the system digests the rule into a database-like or catalog system to store the rule. The rule then becomes part of the bigger system where a hierarchy is applied according to the target language's morphology or grammatical construct. The system then provides a rule-based machine translation. This process continues forever because in RBMT, there isn't a central classifier-based model based on patterns, meaning not a lot of fun machine learning, just rules. A Pertium is a rule-based system developed at my alma mater, the University of Alicante, and it can be considered one of the most proficient RBMT systems. A Pertium is especially used these days with low resource MT systems like Kazakh, where it is very important to gather information and create rules. The rules can be considered part of the grammatical construct, or more so, the morphology of the language. Native speakers typically add rules from both the source language, like say English, and then in the target language, like Spanish. A Pertium then takes the rules in a tree-like fashion and analyzes them, applies them to, and applies them to the produced target language translations. Here we have a depiction of how a Pertium basically handles the rule from beginning to end. Statistical machine translation is based on pure statistics and generally contains various phrases along with probability algorithms to produce the best translation. It was the prime MT system until the rebirth of neural networks and their integration into neural machine translation in the past six or seven years. Either way, we will see later that statistical machine translation is still one of the top paradigms because of its traceability. Similarly, it is easy to, cust to customize because it requires feature engineering and thus less hidden modifications as would occur in neural networks. Experiments using SMT can be considered easy to reproduce and explainable from step one. 
Since they produce high quality using a measurement score known as Bleu, they are not discarded as one of the most powerful paradigms. Moses is the statistical machine translation system that is based on phrases. There's a lot of information here, and I'm going to spend a little more time on this slide to explain everything. The table on the top is a typical phrase table in Moses. Inside of the boxes, we have a sentence in Spanish. Underneath each word is the possibility of various phrases that are gotten from using probability algorithms such as the well-known expectation maximization algorithm. All of the phrases that have been seen for each word and later on group of words are assigned a probability. For example, in the image below, from left to right, we see the first two words that are formed by first choosing Mary for Mary, a 53% probability or which an 18% an probability. 53% probability is chosen, and then the next probable combination of words is Mary did not at 12%. This continues forward until the final decoded sentence is chosen. Statistical machine translation, specifically Moses, is an open source, free machine translation system that provides great results. In some cases, it even performs better than neural machine translation. One of my favorite research papers called The Six Challenges for Machine Translation provides us with some insight into how SMT performs better on longer sentences than NMT. Notice in the results from the graph that the statistical system scores better than the neural system on sentences of length 70 or more. The results presented here are based on translating sentences from English to Spanish. They also assume a huge amount of data. You could consider it big data, since we're at the conference and we all love this stuff. The scores here are all reported using the common scoring metric again, bleu, for machine translation. Okay, now let's dig into the more interesting work on performance. On this slide, the six challenges paper by Kuhn and Knowles, both personal friends of mine, directly compares SMT and with NMT. The green line marks the neural MT system and the blue line marks the statistical MT system. Measurements are using BLE, where a high 20s is considered a good translation. As we can see, as the corpus size, the numbers on the x-axis, x-axis gets bigger, NMT begins to dominate, which shows that MT is somewhat better with bigger data. These results have pushed the industry to achieve higher results with NMT because it shows that SMT doesn't do, so, doesn't do so bad with fewer examples. There's another interesting example on the right-hand side. It is an example of two source sentences on top with their corresponding human reference translations on the bottom. As we can see, the SMT systems do better in one case, but ignore one of the words that NMT replaces incorrectly. So it may not be so clear which one actually wins from a human perspective. Now, we are going to cover what can be considered the newest state-of-the-art machine translation system, Neural MT. As touched on before, they provide less error and high quality when compared to other MT systems. Some studies have even shown that humans generally like NMT translations better than SMT translations despite the blur scores. On the other hand, since they are backed by neural networks, training an MT system can take a long time. Some of the more complex systems can take months to train, depending on the size of the data. Lastly, another downfall to NMT is that they are harder to understand and debug. 
Either way, we will cover them in more detail now. From here out, we're going to discuss the two highest performing paradigms only, SMT and NMT. Both SMT and NMT have their advantages and disadvantages. Neural translation systems are found at Google and other companies. But the main open source ones that we can all use and even modify are OpenMT and Nimitus. OpenNMT was developed at Harvard, and then Nimitus was developed at Edinburgh. Neural architectures are abundant due to computer architecture, which has allowed us to process more data in a shorter amount of time. Statistical, or phrase-based NMT, is generally good at capturing things like punctuation and context-level word differences that rule-based MT also used to capture well. Neural MT is also good at these things, but one can imagine that higher computations along with semantic meaning captures make neural MT somewhat more advantageous. We see examples here that I pulled off of the web where neural MT uses vector space math to make up sentence level features for translating English to Russian. At the same time, we see how statistical phase phrase based MT groups in a word-based translation projection. In my work, I've seen both do well and consider that there's a time and place for statistical and vice versa. Since neural man machine translation and deep learning are cooler, let's review the neural machine translation paradigm. Most of the latest work on NMT is done with the idea of an encoder decoder philosophy, where e encoding is done in the source language and decoding is done in the target language. For example, we see here that embeddings are used in English during encoding, and each sentence is decoded in German. The source language is the original language to be translated, and the target language is the translation. Google and Microsoft are typically using this type of architecture for their translations, and it is important to understand how they work. One of the aforementioned neural MT systems that uses the encoding-decoding idea is OpenNMT. OpenNMT has a lot of great documentation online and can be used with PyTorch to provide optimum translation at no cost. It was, cre it was created by Guillaume Klein at Harvard along with other people at CISTRAN in 2017 and can be considered a state-of-the-art translation engine. It can take advantage of several computer architectures to train models very quickly while being all available as a Python module for easy programming. Much like its predecessors, OpenMT uses a recurrent neural network instead of a convolutional one. It's clear that this has been done for the attention mechanisms that RNNs provide, which have proven to be very valuable. I will cover the RNN attention mechanism shortly, but for now, let's just see how it performs. Here are some of the results written by Klein from CISTRAN and others at Harvard that introduced the OpenNMT system to the scientific community. The results are again using blur scores. The task here was to translate specific English text to German in a famous workshop called the Workshop on Machine Translation in 2015 and later in 2017. First, we noticed that OpenNMT, or ONMT from the results, performs better than its predecessor. Then, we see that it outperforms the best MT system from the 2015 workshop, or WMT referenced by three points on some news articles. Only one, MC, one MT system does better in that study, and that's the Google Neural Machine Translation System, or GNMT. For those who are into deep learning, the open NMT system in this paper uses a bi-directional recurrent neural network. While NMT performs best in most of the latest and greatest MT tasks in conference, my findings with a repair technique called fuzzy match repair 
are indicative that SMT and NMT are comparable. I also published a paper on machine translation paradigms with Knowles and Kuhn from the six challenges paper, and here are the results. My thesis work was done on a technique called fuzzy match repair, which uses the MT system to help translators edit translations. The fuzzy match repair system be considered a good way to evaluate MT systems to help translators uh, understand the agnostic pieces. The main takeaway here is that the scores and the table are based on word error rate, so the lower the better. NMT actually scored better when used as the backing engine for fuzzy match repair and word error rate. However, when strictly measuring the MT output, SMT did better. That is shown in the example where the reference is promover la formación de los recursos humanos. NMT was able to capture the los that SMT lost but loses the important noun formación. As we can see, there are trade-offs to both systems and we should always take that into account when using MT engines. While we have seen some domain-specific cases for languages to do well with st uh, statistical machine translation, it can be said that neural machine translation is generally better than most. NMT has also shown to do well in research uh, by translators and even more than in uh, SMT in various cases. If one wanted to create the best MT system, the ideal situation would, to would be to use both paradigms in an ensemble system. That would give the best performance. Let's also remember that humans themselves don't necessarily agree on translations. As seen in the image, the perfect translation has not been achieved, even by a human. Yet, neural translation for some of the major languages has been shown to dominate the market as far as translation quality is concerned. The nice thing about using NMT is that it creates the features for you in an unsupervised way so that you don't have to spend days feature engineering or building language models as we used to do in SMT. I would say that in my experience, I typically use deep learning for almost everything I do in natural language processing, whether it be translation, information extraction, or topic modeling. There's no doubt that deep learning has taken the forefront of the latest and greatest science achievements, so we cannot take that away from them. Okay, let's step away from the MT topic for a moment to see how big data is involved. How do we know how much big data is actually enough to be considered big data? I had a discussion once with someone about this. Is big data measured in examples? What if I had two sentences written 300 trillion times? Is that big data? This slide presents my thoughts on what can be considered big data. This may actually contradict my previous discussions on this topic, and I think it's always changing. In my mind, the data must be varied enough to build a quality model, and yes, typically ends up being several gigabytes or terabytes of text data or image data. A good example would be books. Books contain several pages of data, yet are around 20 megabytes on average. The books are typically in one language and probably serve well for a very specific domain. But to build a model using books alone, one would probably need several hundreds or thousands of books in several languages. Since the term big data doesn't have a hard definition yet, I will, stick, uh, I will stick to enough quality, balanced data to build a good model is enough for uh, my considerations. Once one has enough data to create a good model for their MT system, it's important to understand the system architecture that it will run on. Software toolkits that give access to multiple cores for calculating algorithm like TensorFlow and PyTorch allow us to train models in a quick way. Before GPU and TPU processing, jobs would take months and even years before providing understandable results. Depending on the size of data, processing, even with a GPU or TPU, may take weeks or months. However, this would be negligible 
considering that the same job 20 years ago was impossible. With the advances of computer architecture, artificial intelligence, and process of complex data, it's feasible. By the way, some of you may ask, what's a TPU? That's a tensor processing unit specifically designed by Google for TensorFlow processing. We've discussed where to get the data from, the machine to process the data, and how to get it ready for models. Now we're going to focus a little more on how transfer learning works with big data. In order to transfer knowledge from one domain to another, we use models that have been previously trained. That way, the save model serves as a mechanism to be loaded into memory for classification or other things. Oftentimes, the models are part of a high-level paradigm called embeddings, where models are frozen in time and used later for transfer knowledge to a new model. In that case, the new model immediately becomes part of something that can be uh, transferred to another project. And this is all done using what's called vector space modeling. Vector space modeling applies specifically to natural language processing by building vectors of information in a numeric format to be used in tasks like machine translation. One vector space modeling technique used for transfer learning is called word embeddings. Word embeddings provide semantic structure and can be pre-trained for many set of texts. Ideally, they contain word information at the sentence and even at the document level. One known me mechanism is called term frequency document inverse frequency, or TF-IDF, where each word represents relates back to its document. Word embeddings are typically created by training a neural network. They are the after product of a classification task and consist of several features that represent semantic similarity between words like man to woman and king to queen. They can be downloaded from public websites and are a key piece that enable MT tasks to take advantage of past knowledge. Word embeddings can be the first part of input in the encoding or training phase of a model that can classify textual data. They are easy to load and can serve as vectors into linear or nonlinear models. Typically, we will see word embeddings as part of a more complex deep learning model. But as the picture depicts, the word vector along with a bias variable can be thrown into a regression or softmax model that provides the final classified output. For our purpose, it's good to know that word embeddings are easy to load and configurable. If you are loading word embeddings on your laptop, you can simply specify to load a lower dimension model of the word embedding if you prefer. That way, you save more time and memory when running the final model which will do computations during the decoding phase. Now that we know what word embeddings are, let's cover how they are typically created. One can create their own word embeddings or download them from the internet. In a domain-specific situation like OpenNMT, the preferred way would be to create your own embeddings. Here's how it's done. First, as is the case in most NLP tasks, we must tokenize and cleanse the text. We may want to perform a procedure called stemming, which gets at the root of the words. Then what's known as bag of words techniques to classify a set of words, typically at sentences. The classification, classification task will create the embeddings as a byproduct of the trained model. Lastly, we save the vectors and provide an indexing mechanism to use them later. As I mentioned, the most typical way to use word embeddings is at least initially to download them from the internet. The three main types of word embeddings are word to vec glove, or fast text. word to vec is probably the most commonly used word embedding type and is primarily what OpenNMT uses. Glove and fast text are also quite common 
especially since fast text comes from Facebook. Since OpenNMT uses word to vec I'm going to show you how easy it is to download a file from the internet. Specifically, specifically I've drawn up the code, which basically shows you how to load a huge uh, file into memory and use it uh, directly into an M MT project. In this case, in this case, PyTorch is integrated right into OpenNMT, and the vector itself is 500 dimensions long. It can, it can be considered highly effective since vector space reduction is done using a very powerful algorithm. Here's what we are seeing are two vectors, one for each word. Each column in the vector represents one of the features previously learned using a classification method. In order to better understand the two main phases of artificial intelligence learning, I present this slide. The two phases, the training phase and the coding phase, are what most machine learning practitioners already know. In the training phase, we train a model with pre-trained word embeddings and known labels along with the word embeddings which serve as knowledge vectors. Then, in the decoding or classification phase, we have brand new sentences which use the word embeddings to create numeric representations and low space vectors. I understand that some of you may already know this, but I want to make sure that we all understand how it works. Now that we have seen how embeddings work, I'm going to go over really quick what our attention-based NT system does. It uses an RNN for the encoding and the decoding of mach for machine translation. Uh, it can be called attention-based uh, machine translation for a reason, and that's because it takes a, a specific layer that sits between the input and the output of the systems. First, the words A, B, C, and D in the picture are presented into the system. Each word carries along with it its own vector and its own word embedding vectors. In the picture, A, B, C, and D are words in a source language that use the word embeddings. The attention layer then transfers al those along to the target language. Okay, here are a few of the results that we have. And we'll see this is from English to German. Here's how OpenNMT performs with word embeddings. The test is on English to German using blur scores as the evaluation metric. We see that OpenNMT is nearly double as, slowly, uh, as slow when training and translating. I guess it's hard to, to beat considering that Nimitus is one of the better systems. Just because it does better on English to German does not mean that it works well with other languages. At the bottom right, we see several sentences or words in Russian that will do well also. But in general, it can be said that uh, research thus far hasn't shown that NMT works well for language pairs like English to Russian or even Finnish. And that could be because of the language construct. So we've seen how various, various artificially intelligent NMT systems work. The question still remains, what are the best ways to make our NMT systems learn like humans? A few of the different options that I consider very important in my work our reinforcement learning, as you see where we have uh, unguided learning, it's where um, you would say the chess game uh, where the computer beat the person in the chess. That's a re really well-known um, reinforcement learning example. There's transfer learning, which we already learned about. Then there's heuristics and rule-based. There's also mixed learning, which combines all of the various models. So the idea really is which uh, MT system do you want to use? At the end of the day, much like humans, machines, machines can process big data over time. With machines, when there's more data, better results are produced. So I would say I recommend using word embeddings when you have low resources, and I recommend that you try to use a hybrid system if possible that combines the power of all three um, paradigms. Thanks again to everyone for attending my presentation, and I hope you enjoyed MT as much as I do.